Hello, and welcome to Where Do We Mourn, our third Conscience Matters webinar of 2023, which will bring together three sites of conscience and the activist Jamira Burley in conversation about how Americans can effectively memorialize sites of police violence against African Americans in their community. My name is Ashley Nelson, and I'm the Director of Communications at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. I'm going to provide a brief introduction and then pass it quickly on to Jamera because there is so much to discuss. For those of you joining for the first time, the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, ICSC, or the Coalition for short, is the only global network of historic sites, museums, and memory initiative that connect past struggles to today's movements for human rights and social justice. Founded in 1999, we now have over 350 members in 65 countries, from Ellis Island in New York City, to former centers of detainment in Argentina, to sites that remember and learn from the transatlantic slave trade in West Africa. While our members focus on a range of subjects, what connects them is their belief that history should be used as a transformative tool for positive change. At Sites of Conscience, memory is considered to be the best weapon civil society has against injustice. By remembering the world's most challenging periods and giving voice to those who have been historically silenced, Sites of Conscience seek justice for harms done so that peaceful futures may take root. In short, we preserve memory, promote truth, and pursue justice. For more information on how to join, please visit our website. Our 2023 webinar series entitled, If Memory Serves on the Uses and Abuses of Remembering, examines the many roles memory plays in contemporary topics and conversations on social justice. From the war in Ukraine to Black Lives Matter, drawing on the experiences of survivors, scholars, practitioners, and most of all, sites of conscience for who over 20 years have functioned as laboratories designed to find the most effective, ethical, and equitable uses of memory. Webinars generally take place on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. New York uh, Eastern time, and we are followed and are followed a week later by a webinar short, which is a brief 20 to 30 minute webinar, usually offering sites of conscience and their allies more practical tools for effectively using history to address social justice today. All webinars are free and open to the public. Please visit our events page on our website for more information. Our talk today will last an hour. I'll begin with a short intro and then we'll jump into our conversation. At the end, there will be a Q&A. Attendees may submit questions throughout the discussion in the QA box, but not in the chat box. The moderator will see them and read them aloud. Today, I'm honored to bring together activist Jamira Burley with three sites of conscience to discuss one of the most enduring and revolting legacies of slavery in America, the rampant persistent killing of unarmed African-Americans by police violence. According to a new study by researchers at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Black Americans are over three times more likely than white Americans to be killed by police. As horrific as it is, the statistic belies the magnitude of the problem in many of our most populous cities. In Chicago, for instance, Black people are over 650 times more likely to be killed by police than whites are. The Black Lives Matter movement begun by three female African-American organizers in 2013, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the shooting death of Trayvon Martin, has amplified awareness of this injustice in profound ways by emphasizing the humanity of these victims. Because of these three courageous women, we know and remember the names Trayvon, Brianna, Tamir. This act of remembering these victims is no small thing in America. While over 2,000 memorials to the Confederacy are still standing in the United States, there is not one national memorial to honor the estimated 10 million people who are enslaved in this country, or even a state-funded monument reflecting on the institution of slavery or its end. Acknowledging and accounting for white violence against African Americans is not and has never been a priority of the US government. This fact makes sites of conscience all the more vital today. Today, I am privileged to welcome three of our members who memorialize sites of white violence against African-Americans to <clears throat> brainstorm and spark conversations about how we can establish permanent spaces where communities can remember these lives lost and connect those memories to initiatives that seek justice and accountability. 
so we can get started. I'm going to somehow limit their all inspiring bio biographies to one line. First, we welcome Dr. Noelle Trent, the Director of Interpretation, Collections, and Education at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, which is located at the site of the former Lorraine Motel, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968. I'm also pleased to introduce Benjamin Salisbury, the Public Engagement and Museum Education Director of the Emmett Till Interpretive Center, which remembers and honors Emmett Till, who in 1955, at the age of 14 years old, was kidnapped and murdered by at least two white men for purportedly whistling at a white woman. We are also lucky to have Daniel Banks, who's co-founder of both DNA Works, an arts and service organization that is dedicated to dialogue and healing through the arts, and transformed 1012 North Main Street, a site of conscience in Fort Worth, Texas, that has acquired a former Ku Klux Klan auditorium there and forming it into the Fred Ralph Center for Arts and Community Healing, named after a black butcher lynched by a white mob in 1921. And finally, Jamira Burley, our friend and getting to be very frequent collaborator. Um, Jamira is a social justice activist with a passion for change at the intersection of community impact investments and philanthropy. Jamira, thank you for being here and for being you. Feel free to take it away. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I had so many thoughts in my head prior to the start of this conversation. And as soon as you did your introduction, I was kind of transported back to um, the time that I used to work for Amnesty International. And it was, we were tracking some of the most hor horrendous um, acts of police brutality in the early 2000s um, and 10s. And, um, you know, I was reminded oftentimes during that, that work is that there was not space for any of us to mourn and to see black people mourn oftentimes was interpreted as violence in itself. Um, and so I am truly excited for this conversation, especially entering a new year because it enables for us to reckon, reconcile with the fact that, you know, Black people are a part of this country and we need to be very intentional about the spaces and places we create in order for us to reconcile with the history that is truly re reflective of the Black experience, um, but also a reflective, too, of, um, you know, America's history, uh, it, which is not separate from the history of Black people. So I'm excited about um, this conversation and the panelists that have, you know, offered their time and energy to this conversation because having these conversations are by no means easy. Um, and it's a lot of weight that we all carry as we, you know, honor the lives and the families impacted and the communities impacted by the violence inflicted upon them. So thank you all for joining you in the audience. And as a reminder, please sh and ask your questions throughout the course of this panel. Um, if it's relevant to the conversation that we're currently having, I'll definitely be sure to insert it into um, the conversation. And so we're going to jumpstart this conversation because we have a very short amount of time. Um, and I want to honor the guests, um, you know, expertise in this conversation. So first up, I want to ask the question, you know, creating morals uh, for Black lives of racial injustice is important, but it's not always easy. What are some of the practical challenges we face in creating these memorials and how can we ensure that we are respected, that they are both respected and protected? And have you seen any effective strategies? I'll also add a caveat. Why is this important even now, more um, now more than ever? And we'll start with um, Noel. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think that the creation of sites of memorial for Black lives and uh, things is incredibly important. Uh, but frequently what we've seen is that it is not the greater community that takes time to recognize, it's the Black community that takes time to recognize and memorialize it. Um, in the case of the National Civil Rights Museum, it was not the government that recognized the value of saving the Lorraine Motel, it was the community that did it. And so we would not have it had it not been for key members of the Black community seeing its value and its importance to history. And then they were able to bring uh, the government and other officials in. But there was no inherent recognition that something happened that had global significance uh, to this. And I also think that the other challenge is because sometimes the memorials are not, don't look, they're not high art, right? They're not fine art. They are ways that people, you know, within the Black tradition 
we have never really had, you know, going back to enslavement, there was, you couldn't have a headstone, right? So people are using field stones, they're using flowers, they're doing, they're, they're creating found objects to mark the loss of someone they love dear. And we continue to see that practice today. Uh, so very rarely is there a formal recognition um, or formal creative sites of memorial. And even when there are, uh, the long-term preservation of that uh, does not happen because they are given way to uh, highways, uh, communities, uh, sometimes uh, landfills. Uh, we see that with so many black cemeteries and, and it's a statement of the value of the social value of black lives and black memorial spaces. And so part of that is a deliberate mental shift. Um, and also, you know, some of this land wasn't valuable then and it's valuable now, but part of the sacrifice of memorial is you set something apart. That's part of that. And so continuing that and to really gain support to make that happen is incredibly important um, to ensure the long-term preservation of these memorials. Thank you for that. Daniel? Well, I think I'd just like to start us off by doing the practice that we do at Transform 1012 North Main Street. And given the, the, the weight and the trauma of the conversation, if I could just invite us all to take a few quiet breaths together, just to ground ourselves and ground this conversation in healing rather than in trauma. So if I may, um, just ask us all to breathe. Thank you. I think uh, to answer your question, it it and 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 to echo what what Noel just said, um, some of the challenges are uh, convincing city leaders and uh, foundations that this is necessary work, that this is work that is um, mandatory. It's not even optional. It must be done if we are going to move forward um, in this country, and if we're going to repair harm uh, that is pervasive and ever-present and um, continues uh, not just economic and geographic redlining, but psychological redlining that, for instance, um, is very apparent to me, still happens in Fort Worth, which is the site of our building, Fort Worth, Texas, and where the Ku Klux Klan not only at one point had the largest um, membership, but also built the headquarters for the Texas Klan. Um, which is what this building behind me was. And so I think, um, you know, the, the, just just getting people over the hump of understanding what is necessary for healing is 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 perhaps one of the greatest challenges. And I also think um, collective memory is important. Um, I just want to add to the names that were listed in this. Uh, in this program, you, uh, Botham Shem John from Dallas was was named, but I also want to uplift and name and honor um, the memory of a Tatiana Jefferson and her immediate family who um, within a few years of a Tatiana Jefferson being shot by a police officer in her home, um, her close relations also died of various ailments, but we can, we can understand um, the role that trauma plays on the heart. We can understand the role that trauma plays, that kind of trauma plays on the nervous system. So while they may not have been in that house with her, um, their lives were also impacted and one might say um, shortened by, uh, by the violence on her. So, so this, this um, radiation out of violence is just, is, we have to remember it's not just the name that we hear but it's also everybody in their sphere, um, known or unknown to them, like you know the way that this has impacted communities across the country um, who may not have personally known that individual, but are impacted by that violence. Yeah, and I would actually go as far as to say, you know, communities around the world. We've now seen the movement for Black Lives kind of transform borders and open a broader conversation around how violence in the U.S. oftentimes is reciprocated through many different forms of systematic injustices. So, yeah, it's it's taken a life of its own and probably has expanded far beyond anyone's imagination, original imagination. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. Benjamin? 
Um, so, I mean, the, the responses given by my colleagues uh, have, have pretty, I mean, I would all but echo and affirm what they've shared. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that is, and even this kind of affirms what's been stated, is that um, also, I think the, I think one of the, the most practical yet daunting challenges is getting society to the place and space where, where, where society as a whole um, sees everyone as people and not just uh, a category a category of people right and and the reason i uplift that is because i think uh that impacts um every facet of community and society so for example uh the point that was raised earlier when we think about how uh when we think about uh, black spaces and the black narrative and the black experience in this country uh those uplifts usually happen by uh um a great push of Black folk and Black community. Uh, uh, it takes so much energy and effort on the parts of, of this particular community to, to be recognized in a way that is respectful, right? In a way that is integral, right? Um, and it's not until sometimes potential economic profit is, is recognized additionally for which other um, aspects of society begin to somewhat buy in. So I think the challenge is getting um, more people, I don't even say all people, but getting way more people, uh, regardless of political affiliation and everything else, to clearly see uh, the importance of valuing the humanity of people and figuring and then understanding that that means we have to be very intentional and deliberate in the, in, you know, in the maintenance and upkeep and development of memorial spaces and how those spaces um, 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 are part of the American experience and American identity, as well as the people that, you know, that, uh, that for which they're being created. For. Yeah. Oh my God. So that's a, such a great point. And I think it really um, weaves in the conversation from Noel and Daniel, this idea of like humanity, right? Um, Cause it's not just the audience of black people that we have to convince of why these spaces are important, why they should visit them, why they should participate, why they should invest their time and energy, but also the broader community of recognizing the lives of black people as human um, and recognizing that, you know, to Daniel's point that this is not just about trauma. This is also about, you know, a level of, um, um, honoring and celebration of the lives of Black people that should always be rooted in trauma. Um, and using these moments or these sites as, a, as an opportunity to reconcile with history, like the real reality of what's happening here. Um, but the human part is, is so prevalent because that's all, oftentimes how we got to the need to have these sites in the first place because police don't see Black people as human, which is why they inflict so much violence that oftentimes result in um, and murder. Um, so thank you for those comments. You know, you know, I think one thing that's also um, really gets at the tension of why these sites are so important in the, the broader conversation of, um, you know, the violence imp imp inflicted upon Black people is this idea that families are oftentimes put with the responsibility of having to elevate these stories to the national stage to, you um, to draw awareness to the crimes of the police um, and then expect it to then create some kind of ecosystem for rem remembering the violence inflicted upon their family members. And those are skills and responsibilities that most families do not have, are not equipped to do. Um, that's why we've seen a lot of like, a lot of folks emerge from these incidents, um, running for office, um, staging um, really massive protests, but they're not oftentimes not equipped to do that that responsibility. So I'm curious for you all, um, you know, how would how can communities work with families in a respectable way and eyewitnesses to keep the human aspect of these stories alive? Um, and how how off, how much pressure should we put on parents or families um, who are still suffering and are suff and have suffered um, through these incidents to try to continue to elevate these stories to a larger stage? Um, and I'll start with you this time. Daniel. Thanks for that question. If I could just tag one thing onto the last statement that you made too, is one of the unique things about the Fred Rouse Center is that while it is named after Mr. Fred Rouse, um, who, uh, as was mentioned, was lynched in 1921, a Black man who was lynched in 1921, um, but also we recognize the lynching of Hispanic men in Texas. We recognize the violence against Jews and LGBTQ folks in Fort Worth and in Texas. And so these intersecting violences, right, these intersecting um, that that not to diffuse 
the subject matter here today, but just to, to, to recognize that it is part of an even larger fabric, as you said, the greater humanity, as Benjamin was saying. So I just wanted to, to name that um, because there is also unique challenges in, in trying to represent multiple um, traumatized and, and aggrieved uh, constituency groups um, where where no one's been recognized, and so then how do you how do you manage that um, uh, that you don't dif diffuse the importance of one group by actually also lifting up all groups? Um, um, thank you, thank you for that that question. Um, uh, sorry, I got myself off track here, and I have long COVID, so my brain can only do one thing at a time. Can you say that makes two of us? <laughs> A community and family, right? That the fa the families. Um, it's not my story to tell, so I will I will I, I will be brief and tell um, the part that 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 I that I played a part in. Um, but I will say that um, one unique thing about this project is that when uh, my husband Adam McKinney and I began it, um, we were contacted um, by a man named Fred Rouse, who said, "I." a fraternity brother uh, told me I should reach out to you all. And um, my name is Fred Rouse and you're talking about Fred Rouse and he's the grandson of Mr. Fred Rouse, but that family did not know that history. So actually in a kind of a reversal, that family was brought into this process and um, uh, be have become central in this process. Fred is on our board and is now the president of another partner organization that is similarly uh, memorializing Mr. Rouse, um, and uh, um, and 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 so so now it is it is truly a collaborative process between us and the families. Um, so I think there there are many other things to be said, but I'll I'll pass the mic now and see if I can can think of anything else. Thank you, Benjamin. Yes. Oh, uh, so I, I want to be clear that the statements I'm making and, and the statements that I'll make later are responses not to be deemed as absolute, um, I guess, ideas or, or strategies, right? Mm -hmm. These are just my thoughts and beliefs. And as with most thoughts and beliefs, there are probably some better ones out there from some much smarter folk. With that being said, um, I, it, so the question you raise is, a, is a, well, it's a multifaceted question. And one of the parts that I definitely want to uplift is like, and I'm paraphrasing, is, is that portion of, of how do we support family, like especially those families that are in direct deep mourning, right? When we think about um, them having loved ones who were murdered. Um, and so I think one of the ways we support families is, is to do the best we can to give them the space and the autonomy to grieve in whatever healthy ways and means they can. And this is what I mean by that. I think very often, well, not very often, I think when we think of, of when, when a community member's life is lost under any circumstance, even when it's not violent, there, you know, there's like a collective hurt, right? Because that person was part of our community or part of, 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 of our experience, right? Of our lived experience. And so to lose a loved one, even under somewhat normal circumstances, is still tough. Now, when that is coupled or stratted, right, with brutality or murder or any of the isms that, that give way to that loss of life, uh, though, you know, that pain is magnified on the community level as well as with the individual. Um, with that being stated, I think uh, it's, imp it's, if there, the, I think the best things we can do is, is be support systems for those families, right, to allow them to know that it is not their burden and responsibility uh, alone and exclusive to become spokespersons for these pains. And even though history has shown us that there have been folks who have done that of their own volition and with the encouragement of others, uh, quite often, again, I want to up the fact that they did that because they knew they were supported or they believed they were supported. So I think some of the ways that we, we support those persons is to let them know that, hey, you have every right to grieve in whatever ways you need to, and that there are ways for us to speak out against these injustices without um, running the risk of, of of adding pain to your grieving season and process. Because uh, often, or, or sometimes, I think society will see these flashpoint moments uh, where we're kind of exhibiting examples of our lower selves and us then wanting to be better. And then when that moment passes, 
well, that family is still in mourning, right? That family is still in deep grief, right? That mother or that parent is still, you know, having to go on in life absent of their child or absent of their loved one uh, because of, you know, some of these isms. And then that support for that is diminished or isn't recognized as it should be, or, or is it in place uh, for the reasons and purposes that it's necessary. So I think when it comes to family, I, I think it's important for us not to um, place added responsibility on the family of those that are hurting or grieving. But I think it is important for us to do the best we can to, um, to respectfully show them that they're not grieving alone. And even though we're not, we don't grieve the same way, because this is your direct loved one, you have the support of those around you. At least you, they should have the support of those around them to, you know, to let them know that whatever choices they choose to make that are healthy, good, and, 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 and a, you know, sound mind and body, uh, then you have people in your corner locally and otherwise that, that also um, um, agree and will uh, go to bat for you in, in your time of need and in your, uh, uh, and in your efforts going forward. That's such a great point. It's like a duality of both being recognizing that this is a collective responsibility of all of us, right? To show up, to speak up, to organize, while also at the same time not being, you know, not putting undue pressure on family members who are still in the process of grieving. Many of these families are just lost loved ones days before many of these protests or hours before many of these protests. And so Honoring those two realities at the same time. Well, to Daniel's point, you know, not not also putting ourselves in the shoes of people whose stories, um, who 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 those are their lived experiences um, in real time. Um, Noel, I want to bring you into this conversation because you know you work at a site that is that is representative of one of the largest and most well-known civil rights leaders of our time or any time within the United States history. And, you know, many folks are well familiar with his story, um, well familiar with MLK Jr.'s work. Um, and more importantly, you know, MLK in many ways was was a part of the movement that many people assume that, you know, it's 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 not unlikely that um, there was violence um, inflicted across Black folks. And so I'm curious, you know, what is that duality of that reality that you experience in the work and telling that story um, as such a monumental site and connecting or interweaving, um, you know, past tr atrocities against Black people to what's happening right now? Well, the National Civil Rights Museum, we've been in existence since 1991. We were the country's first museum specifically dedicated to telling the African-American civil rights story. So embedded in that is an acknowledgement of the martyrs of the movement. And that's always been part of our storytelling. But from a larger perspective, a good portion of our visitors just come because this is the place where Dr. King died. They come to, this is a pilgrimage space, they come to uh, pay homage to Dr. King. And then in the aftermath of terrible national tragedies, everything from Sandy Hook to Pulse nightclub uh, to Tyree Nichols, Trayvon Martin, all these moments in our nation's uh, most recent history, people come here for guidance. We are a beacon of light. And so uh, there's a lot of responsibility that the staff from our security guards to our frontline personnel really feels in the work that we do, that it's something that's very much uh, we're all aware of in our work every single day. There's not a moment that you're not thinking about uh, you're participating in not only preserving this story, but helping people understand the importance of paying homage uh, and respecting the memory of the lives lost. Uh, and so that's really embedded in the work. It's embedded in the work culture here. And so what that results in is this larger sort of unspoken uh, inner driver within the organization that we're always commenting, we're always trying to figure out how do we help the world and quite literally the world because we have national and international visitors process these moments, process these strategies while also caring for ourselves. That last part gets to me, you know, um, those who are always caring for others, who takes care of them. And all of you are doing really impactful work that is, you know, should never be overlooked because it's, it's 
you know, it's trauma. Um, we're constantly inundated with the trauma and the work, um, but there are moments of inspiration when we've seen the, what has been accomplished due to that trauma um, by the collective work of all of us together. So um, I definitely want to honor all of you as you continue to do this work because it's 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 not easy by any means. Um, you know, Noah, I want to kind of um, dig a little bit deeper into that comment because, you know, um, Tyree Nichols was uh, murdered not too far from the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. And um, that is a story that has touched many people around the country, around the world, um, who are trying to grapple with the fact that this is still happening, right? Um, how, what, a, what, uh, what resources does the National Civil Rights Museum offer as folks are engaging with um, the stories, are engaging with the site? Um, how, how, how have been one of the, what are some of the ways in which you all have um, engaged that audience who have looked for, you know, answers, who are trying to mourn while also trying to become activated. Yeah, so um, Tyree Nichols, uh, his death occurred within the city of Memphis. Uh, and so for us, it was shocking. Um, the family did come on campus during our MLK holiday to hold a press conference uh, to really discuss what was happening. This is before we heard any of any public action by our uh, city uh, DA, district attorney, as well as um, the chief of police. Um, and, you know, I, I have to be honest, it was a gut punch to everybody in Memphis. This was really difficult and it felt very different from George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd was Minneapolis. This is where we live. Um, there's Memphis is a city, but it also has a small town kind of feel. So many of the staff and folks either know where this happened, um, know or have some sort of knowledge of the officers involved, uh, have some sort of knowledge of the family. Uh, and so there was a internal sort of practicality of just addressing our own trauma acknowledgement, like our own realization. And then within that, at you know, when the video was released, that was one of the first things that we had to figure out is trying to figure out the timing of that. I will say that our um, district attorney, Steve Mulroy and Chief Davis, CJ Davis, did act differently than other situations. So they acted pretty rapidly in terms of suspending the officers, ultimately terminating them and ultimately filing charges. So that did help mitigate some of the tension, but then people want to know, you know, what's going on. So when the videos released, we do see, a, we did see a little bit of an uptick of visitors or people just wanting to come to the site uh, to gather. And we had to sit down and really think through what did we want to do. Um, we have, since I've been here for seven years, there have been a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of these deaths. And it just feels like as soon as you figure out how you're dealing with one, another one happens, right? And so collectively the staff and the team uh, decided, you know, we're, we're tired of the memorials and the marches, they have their place, but we feel like we need to offer our community something substantive. So the museum is doing a series of um, convenings over the next year. The first one will happen on March 30, 30th and it's called The Reckoning. And the reckoning will be an opportunity for us to really delve into the issues of police brutality. We will have uh, the family of Tyree Nichols there, as well as um, other um, individuals in the national conversation around police brutality. And this will be an opportunity for us to explore the current moment, but also acknowledge some of the other historical deaths, like the death of young Larry Payne on March 28th, 1968, as a result of the Memphis sanitation strike, and Alton Hayes, who was killed in 1971, and pull all of that together. We'll also have another series that will handle more of the community and police dynamic, as well as a healing session culminating in a summit in 2024. But the other thing that we've done is to um, kind of make our name around rapid response exhibitions as current events pop up. Um, and usually it's my team that does that. And usually I'm like, something happens, we charge forth, we, we kind of tackle it. I had to slow up because this hit us differently. Uh, and so we really sat down and had to process how we were feeling and we began to just kind of throw all the ideas on the table. And the thing with rapid response is you're kind, you're, you are 
creating the text and the dialogue along with trying to figure out how you're gonna present this. So we were able to go to a local skate shop called Cheat Skates and they gave us some used skateboards. We were able to connect with a black artist and he has helped us connect with other black artists in the community. So they're going to create art on skateboards. And then our, we are going to feature some of Tyree's photography and, and um, film footage of him skating. We chose, we were tired of the, pardon the phrase, trauma porn aspect around all of this. So we are choosing to celebrate his life, his humanity and provide him human dignity. So our goal with this will be, and we're, we're trying to open it around the same time as the reckoning, uh, this rapid response exhibition will be in a space in our guest lounge, a space where visitors can decompress, but then they can take in the joy of his life and really understand that when his life was taken, we lost someone who could contribute to society and his contributions as an artist, as a son, as a father. Um, we will never know the dynamics of it, but we hope that we can get just a glimpse of that. And the beauty of art is that it helps us process so many things on so many different levels. So we're excited to see their artists are working on it right now, but that's how we're, we're doing it. We moved to let's figure out some real solutions um, for this and have meaningful conversations. And then we're also going to push uh, our audience to, you know, advocate for the Justice for George Floyd Act, to advocate for changes, not just in Memphis, but in communities across the country. The model here should be replicated and we need to see even more meaningful change across the country. Thank you for that, because it also points to the need for us to control the narrative, right? Because we know when many of these incidents occur, um, the pictures that they use of victims, the stories that they tell about victims oftentimes try to paint them in a bad light, even though the justice system knows um, that they are not at fault. Um, so I appreciate the work you all are doing because um, it's a reminder that these folks are more than the worst thing that has ever happened to them um, and that they had depth and they had um, and that they were contributing to society. So um, that's amazing. You know, Benjamin, um, Noel just mentioned the idea of justice. And, you know, memorials to victims of police brutality should be connected to justice and accountability, which you know, when I think about memorials growing up in, in West Philly, only time we saw a memorial was, you know, flowers on the corner or the sneakers, the laces tied up to um, the flag post. Um, but they should be connected to justice in a more substantial way that is embodied within our community. Can you talk about your work acquiring the courthouse where um, Emmett Till's murder, murderers were acquitted? And why was that important to you? Yeah, I'd be, I'm more than happy to. So, uh, so as stated, the Tallahatchie County Courthouse in Sumner is the location where the infamous trial of J.W. Mime and, and Roy Bryant that took place in September 1955 for the murder of Emmett Till. And as we already know, you know, they were found not guilty. Um, and to my knowledge, no recourse of, of any sort from a legal standpoint took place for the remainder or duration of their lives. So when it came to our community, um, we began a, a process of well, well, we begin um, looking at uh, the impacts uh, racism has had on our state, but more specifically in Tallahatchie County. And one of the glaring, well, not one of, but arguably the most glaring example of racism was not just the torture and murder of Emmett Till, uh, but you know the ex exhibition of racism by way of, of, of the customs and practices that would give way to an all white, all male jury uh, to, you know, to deliberate for an hour and six minutes in the first place. Right. And so acknowledging that that when we think about race and racism, it's not just the brutality that's expressed upon the body or, or upon the taking of life from one person by way of another. Uh, but it's the absence of accountability across the board and the absence of even the ability to, to verbalize or word those things safely and without fear of retribution. Right. Um, our the the Emmett Till memorial commission was created in 2005 as a biracial body that began trying to figure out what steps we can take short term and long to if nothing more to recognize that we've been impacted by racism um so the official mission of that commission i believe was to cultivate racial harmony in Tallahassee county and other places i'm paraphrasing that of course but that was like the gist of it and the things that we that they had control over or at least the things that they knew that they had, for lack of a better word, I should say, control over was um, how we use the spaces that, that, that we encompass and share. 
And so at the time, the Tallahassee, the Tallahassee County Courthouse uh, was actually, well, the courtroom, I should say, had fallen to dilapidation. And we believe that like a lot of other structures that are tied more specifically to black stories and black narratives in America, but then also how those stories are part of the American story, it's it further disrespects the memory of Emmett and Mamie Till Mobley to allow a space like that to fall apart when there are, you know, when there are ways for us to at least consider how we preserve this space. And then we went from thinking about ways to preserve it to why should we preserve it? And part of the reason we believe it's important to preserve it is because that's part of deliberate remembrance, right? It's one thing to apologize and it's one thing to place markers in spaces and, and that is appropriate. There's nothing wrong with uh, having a uh, stop shop, so to speak, for people to give um, um, eyes and, 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 and thought to some of these stories that are part of our communities. But what can we do um, to these structures that are part of the larger American story, the courthouse being one of them. And so preserving it and now having it uh, used not just as a courthouse, because it is a functioning courthouse, uh, but, but having it also to be a space where young people share and tell the narratives they create through photo documentary workshops that we've been able to host is another uh, point of utility and deliberate remembrance. Uh, it's good to remember uh, and, and it's good to do so uh, purposefully and intentionally of the things that have impacted us from the past and because those things can and often do impact us at present, but it's just as important if not I mean, but it's very important too to use the arts and other mediums to process those traumas, right? But then to also process the present, right? To process um, our close relation to these things and, and the hopes that that positions us uh, to not be at the mercy of these histories. So, so it was extremely important for us to not allow that space uh, to just fall away like so many other spaces have that are tied to uh, the, the story and narrative of Emmett Till and Emmett Till Mobley. And, and, and currently we're still able to, 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 hold, to use that uh, with, other, with other use cases as well. But for time's sake, I won't go into that. No, that's such a great point because it's a reminder that like there's the violence of the act that, that, that against our physical bodies, but also there's the violence of the system not actually seeking justice. And then what happens to those places where we were inflicted violence upon. Um, there's a great question from the audience from Nancy, shout out to Nancy. What do you think are the psychological benefits to the community to memorialize racial trauma, particularly trauma inflicted by with you um, with that question or anyone who wants to answer? Well, I'll say this as a site of racialized trauma that with a very complicated legacy with the state, with our government, conspiracy <laughs> theories still abound and there's evidence that has been embargoed till 2029. And so, yeah, uh, I, I live and breathe this. Um, there is value in setting something apart. Um, there is value in people having places and spaces to heal, right? Um, it It's part of how we're socialized. And when we look at any of the major religious practices across the globe, we always see memorials or spaces set apart. Um, these are places that because of the, the type of violence committed, it changes the dynamic of the ecosystem, right? And so um, it is glib when we gloss over it, when we pave over it. It is literally trying to ignore something, but that doesn't mean that trauma doesn't exist in that environment. Here in um, Benjamin and I are in the same region of the country. So Ole Miss has not repaired the bullets on the building from James Meredith. Jackson State has not repaired the bullets on the dormitory during that 1970 um, incident with the state. Reason being is so that you walk by every day and acknowledge that. And I think that part of us being able to reconcile and continue to commit spaces of memory is to, cons is to consider turning those places that were devoted to Confederate monuments and uh, legal and extra legal violence into places to reflect this ongoing legacy because they are everywhere in the country and we need those spaces and it doesn't matter what happens to the land value or anything, we are obligated because of the level of sacrifice that happened there to always preserve them. And if I could um, jump in, I, I, I wanna continue what both uh, Noel and Benjamin have talked about the arts role in healing from trauma. Behind me, you'll see a circle of people in front of our building, um, 1012 North Main Street. 
And that was part of a program that DNA Works and Transform 1012 created together called Fort Worth Lynching Tour, honoring the memory of Mr. Fred Rouse, where we took participants to four of the sites associated with that lynching, but in reverse order, so as not to repeat the order of the lynching every time, and um, used an augmented reality app where we commissioned artists to respond to each of the sites through uh, music or poetry or visual arts. And the reason for commissioning those artists to do that, and the uh, as was the reason for having a Black mental health professional on each tour, was to model the role of the arts in healing from trauma, the role, how artists process trauma, and that there, and that there is even, I mean, this sounds um, perhaps uh, hard to, hard to say or fathom or whatever, but I think that there are many people who don't believe that it's possible to heal from trauma because of this psychological redlining that I spoke about at the beginning. There's so much internalized um, fear and internalized self-hate and other things that, that 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 the road to healing almost seems impossible. So in this region, it felt very important to show that there is the possibility of healing from trauma. This is the process. The process is shaking and breathing and crying and publicly acknowledging uh, the wrongs and the harms that have been done, and also to create from it. That something, um, as, as several people have said, can be born out of this that doesn't have to refer back, that doesn't have to reproduce the trauma in its representation, but that can actually grow out of it and turn into something else, transform into something else. And so I think that that is very much the role to, to just circle back to the language of this question, that is very much our role in um, providing spaces of, of psychological healing is that these, these sites, these buildings can be, and, and, and the Fred Rao Center will be uh, a, um, a cultural hub with arts groups and visual arts and theater and dance in it, that, that, that this, this is the role that these sites can play in terms of healing. Thank you for that. Um, and Benjamin, before you answer, I want to expand on the question for you because we have a question from the audience. Um, and shout out to Catherine for the question. Um, she asked whether the Confederate Memorial is still standing outside the courthouse. What is the sim what does the symbol mean regarding who is in power there? And talk more about the difficulty situations with Emmett Till, ongoing efforts to truly that are truly given um, in that community. If you if you would do me a favor, what was the original question to? Yeah, the original question was, what are the psychological benefits to having memorials? Okay, yeah, okay, thank you for that. Um, and so I'll try to tie my response into both. Um, so, <clears throat> and I want to be clear that I am by no means um, a, a, a therapist or anything like that. So what I'm going to share is from the outside, way, way, way from the outside. Um, Quite often when, when a person experiences trauma, like the body itself records it, you know what I mean? And what I mean by that is, it's not just the thing that, that you, the, the, the picture or the movie in your head, your body actually uh, stores part, portions of that as a coping mechanism. And the response to that coping can be, you know, often, it, it, you know, it's like fight or flight, right? And so the way that that, that, that coping shows itself uh, uh, can impact one's ability to function in the whole of society. Well, again, my theory, and it's strictly my theory, uh, I think that too exists as a collective, right? I think as a collective body that experiences trauma, uh, absent of therapy or absent of, of continued um, um, efforts towards healing or towards uh, a remedy, we have these examples where we are triggered and as such, uh, uh, the triggering speaks to the necessity of, of positioning one's body and mind uh, to bring itself back into equilibrium and safety. Uh, and that's not easy. So I think when in light of that reality, it's important to, to, um, to, to create spaces where we can safely acknowledge these things. But I think as important as it is to create these spaces for memorials, it's also, to the best of our ability, we, we also have to position uh, the collective body to go through these spaces in such a way that call for and give way to uh, processing it as safely as possible. So I think some of the safety that comes into that, in theory anyway, is to be able to say very matter of factly what these spaces are, what they encompass or what they have encompassed. And then also with a considerable amount of intentionality, uh, um, um, 
have reimagined utility for those spaces. And I think that's not just on the, on, that's not just the burden of an organization, right? I think that's the responsibility of community and society at large to figure those things out. Now, looking, now speaking very specifically about co the Confederate Memorial um, um, that's in front of the Tallahatchie County Courthouse in Sumner. Um, and, and the reality around the symbolism as well as the ideology that A would give way to its erection in, I wanna say 19, 14 and B, it's you know it's still standing. Well, that speaks to uh, this. In, in my opinion, I'll say it this way. Well, that speaks to a trauma response, right? Sometimes silence is a trauma response, and and for a very 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 long time, this community in particular um, has suffered silently, right? So much so to where there are some persons who aren't even aware one that that is a Confederate statue, and two what that means, and, and, and three, what that can mean for those that come into contact with it, right? So it, it, without a doubt, it's jarring to see that, especially when we think of the history concerning uh, Mississippi and concerning Tallahatchie County, but then all that too being coupled or, or tripled with, uh, with, with the reality that Mrs. Mimi Till Mobley uh, had to come face to face with that statue when it comes to the trial of the two men that murdered her son. Well, and that is a hard reality. Um, and, and, and so our community is still grappling with and trying to reckon with how do we recognize this, the stories of this statue and how it is a part of this larger story for Tallahatchie County and a larger story for Mississippi and, and the silence that still prevails even on the national front when we think about um, how and why there was a Confederate army and a Confederacy in the first place, and what that means in present day 2023 as we continue to find ways to, un to um, you know, to not just process, but actually um, um, be better versions of ourselves absent without divorcing uh, ourselves from the truth of those symbols and those statues. Yeah, and, and I appreciate you mentioning like the fact that people mourn differently. Some of that mourning is outward, some of that mourning is internal. Um, and that's why I think these sites are are important because oftentimes to show up and participate in many of these sites, you're doing it from a level of like music and art and celebratory and like congratulatory um, efforts in honor of what has been accomplished since many of these um, these tragic events. So, you know, I think all of those those reactions and those responses should be honored. And to your point, Daniel. Um, I'm reading a really good book called My Grandmother's Hands. And it's the idea that we are not just carrying in our bodies the physical trauma of what we've experienced directly, but also the trauma of our, our past generations and how we reconcile with um, you know, seeking help and, and recognizing the signs of uh, you know, that brutality. Um, and it it requires us to know the history not of not just our family, but also to the broader African American community. Um, which brings in my next question, <clears throat> because if there's anything that we notice right now is that there is a war on Black people um, coming from many different directions um, and trying to kind of uh, eliminate the history of Black folks, um, both through critical race theory, both through just celebratory history of what Black people have accomplished in this country, despite being under bondage and despite in hostile conditions. Um, and so the question is, you know, how can we speak out against systematic injustices without alienating white folks or white America? Um, and have you and have you seen truly effective strategies to institute real change through, uh, I would say, collective impact and, and collaboration with white America? Who want to start first? I'll, I'll go. Um, Benjamin and I are in two states that are quite, <laughs> you don't have to laugh then. Um, oh gosh, uh, we, we, we are dealing with some things down here in this Mid-South, Deep South region right now. And so it is literally affecting our work. And I mean that from the fact that uh, I know school teachers who've received um, forms from our state government and the school district because it's mandated by the state that they have to do inventories of their books because there are certain books that cannot be taught. And the books that can't be taught are Rosa Parks's uh, biography, Martin Luther King, Ruby Bridges, who when I first arrived in Tennessee seven years ago was part of the state curriculum. So kids in fifth grade across the state of Tennessee were required to learn about Ruby Bridges' story. Um, so we we have been taught we have been told 
uh, by the school district that legislatively we cannot tell certain stories. There are certain authors. Yeah, no, there, 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 there's this weird thing of books not being allowed. And so we have had to get really creative with how we tell the story. Our, our, my premise has always been to echo the perspective of Secretary of the Smithsonian Lonnie Bunch to say that Black history is American history. And so we have really had to fall back on historical methodology and using primary sources, right? And I have said this publicly before, I got no problem using the state's laws to teach about segregation. You want to have, I, this is what y'all said in 1960 something or 1930 something. I have no problem with putting that out there for the conversation. Uh, part of it is, you know, we just have to keep doing the work of telling the truth. But then this is where the role of accomplices come in, right? Because it's not my duty to educate and make everybody feel comfortable. I have a role in this, but my white accomplices also have a role of this, similar to the LGBTQ plus fight in this state right now, because if you haven't heard, starting April 1, uh, drag shows have been ruled in the state of Tennessee as being um, that you cannot do anything in front of children. It has been deemed pornographic. So my role in that is it's not the LGBTQ plus community's role to just educate everybody. I have a responsibility as a member of this community seeing this injustice to speak up from my perspective and to so support them in that. So that's part of that interrelated uh, work that we have to do. Um, but it is challenging times right now in this area of the country. Thank you for that. Yeah. I yeah, I, I was. I promise I wasn't trying to laugh because it's not a funny, you know, situation we find ourselves in. Uh, it's a I little guess, ridiculous, though. It's a little. We're ridiculous. laughing through our pain. Yeah, right. I was about to say that. Like, you know, you laugh to keep from crying, or you laugh to keep from from breaking something, right? Um, and so I, I. So okay, for for us, and I. You know what? I, maybe I'm speaking prematurely, but I think for a lot of people, we understand that 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 when it comes to the history of, of, of black folk, these are this, you know, we're not talking about theories, right? Like we're not talking about hypotheses, right? These are points of record, right? Points of record that have been, that are documented, that can be found in text as well as online and everything else. So it is, it is disturbing that um, you have entities and you have individuals, I should say, who fear, objective information. And I may be out of line when I say this and forgive me if I am, but I do think there's a huge difference in teaching hate versus teaching history, right? It's one thing if and when you have people or persons or districts or whoever's uh, teaching from, from a point or an agenda that, that pits students against people for a reason versus positioning educators and others to allow them to simply share from an objective yet um, um, credible standpoint things that have happened and, and then um, doing the best they can to position students to think critically around those realities. And so I'm not an educator, right? Like I don't teach K through 12 or anything like that. Um, but in, in, you know, what I will say in theory is, uh, you know, it would be great if there were safe ways for which districts and others um, can can collaborate consistently with bodies that that are rooted and grounded in in these facts and in these parts of reality, and know that they they too wouldn't suffer retribution for doing such. Now, what will and what should that look like? What mechanisms and vehicles should that um, should should exist to make that a reality? I think. It, I think that falls on the responsibility of all of us to really figure out and strategize how to make that a reality because ultimately those that are hurt by this absence or this deliberate uh, dismissal of objective knowledge are these young people. And that just further, uh, um, it can rather further um, increase the likelihood of having more generations of people not being aware of the world around them, which, sir, which is to the detriment of all of us. Yeah, that last point, and I'll hand it over to you, to Daniel. Um, 
it's we're literally equipping them to be able to navigate the world by no means. Um, and this hurts both white people and black, I mean, black people and white people when you don't tell them the story, but then, you know, expect them to go into the universe and participate. Um, Daniel. I'll be very brief because I know we're at time. I'll just say that the strategy that we've used from the beginning is one-on-one -on -one conversations, a lot of listening, a lot of um, just really connecting with people on a heart level. And um, we've, we've had probably in the last three or four years, maybe 4,000 one-on-one conversations with people um, just to share back and forth. And that has actually um, accelerated our process in ways that I could have never imagined as a Northeasterner coming to Texas, having an assumption of the, the kind of reception that we would get. We've had the complete opposite reception, but I think it's because of this um, understanding building, I won't even call it sympathy or empathy building because those are laden words, this understanding building um, that, that happens. And so uh, I just go back to listening, start with listening and start with that old grassroots methodology of, of person to person, one person at a time. It's labor intensive, but it actually, I feel, um, deepens the work and, and, and deepens the roots and the possibility for the work to succeed. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. Different tactics work for different communities. And so it's really important to understand the communities that you work in um, and try different things um, to test it out. And for the audience listening to Noella's point, you know, it's not our responsibility to teach you everything and anything. Um, if you're going to move from allyship to co-conspirator, um, it really requires you all, also unlearning to relearn by, you know, having these conversations, as Daniel mentioned, to hear the stories, to understand the history and be able to do the work. Um, with that being said, I'm now going to turn over back over to Ashy, Ashley, and thank you for everyone who joined us this morning to participate in this great dialogue. Thank you so much. I am I'm so grateful to all of you. That was um, it was just incredibly insightful and moving. Um, I, I appreciate you all being here. Um, I just wanted to make two quick notes before we leave. Um, I wanted to make you all aware that our next um, webinar, it's a webinar short, it will be a 30 minute um, presentation uh, by our Transitional Justice Department on reparations. Um, we will use um, examples of reparations around the globe to talk about how we might um, begin to um, use them more effectively and uh, throughout America. So that will be uh, March 23rd at 10 a.m., one week from today. Um, I'm also going to start a poll. Um, this really helps us plan our future programming. Um, so if you could stay on for a minute and just finish it, um, we would be so grateful. Um, but finally, I just wanna give one more thank you, huge thank you to Jamira, Noel, Benjamin, and Daniel for their um, thoughts and their time and their dedication. Thank you all for being here. Bye-bye. <laughs>